I have the privilege of uh, bringing the word of the Lord this morning, and to say that I've labored over it, I think would be uh, an understatement. Um, yeah, First Samuel, the fourth chapter. You know, sometimes I'm, con I'm convinced it's harder to give a word than receive a word. You've heard me use the example of praying for a lady and the Lord put in my spirit a nursery rhyme. I mean, how, you really feel stupid when you stand in front of somebody in a prayer line saying, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. And it's harder to give that word than it is sometimes to receive it. And I believe the Lord's given me a word this morning, and I pray for his grace and his sufficient help to be able to articulate it correctly. Laura shared a really funny story. My daughter-in-law shared a really funny story with me in that they were praying last night, Evan, Laura, and Harper. And all of a sudden, Harper's going, Dad, 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 and just could not be quieted and, and, and in the prayer and, and as they prayed. And so then they prayed for Oma, that's Donna, and, and she still couldn't, and finally they prayed for Papa, and that's me. And they prayed, I guess, for 10 minutes, and then she was at peace. Spirit of intercession. So let's see <laughs> what we have this morning. Turn with me to 1 Samuel, the fourth chapter. It's really hard to read Scripture in the last two months and not read into it everything that's going on. But God's word has a way of pointing to us and speaking to us and becoming alive that a, a then word can become a now word. So as we read in the first chapter, this is, uh, Israel is in a very tough situation. Her priests are, are less than pure. It's uh, Eli's sons are sleeping with the women in the temple. I mean, and they're priests. So Israel is in a really difficult, declining situation. And 1 Samuel 4, 1 says, now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. And Israel was de defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men in the army, in the field. Hmm. So Israel, they, they compete uh, on more equal terms with Moab or the Ammonites, but the Philistines had this Greek, Greek military equipment, superiority. They had helmets and, and shields and chain mail and, and swords. You know, if you remember the story of Jonathan and Saul in an army when the Philistines had circled around about them, in all of their 600 men, Israel had two swords. So fighting the Philistines, they were really formidable opponents. And they were first people in Canaan to process iron, and they made the most of it. They were an immigrant people out of what many people believe, the Isle of Crete and military leadership. And because of this dominance, they were quickly reducing Israel to a condition of being a subjected race. If we go to verse 3, it says, And when the people had come into the camp, so this is after they lost this battle, 4,000 men died. So when the people came into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Now, I think that's an odd question. They didn't say, why did the Philistines kick our rear end? They said, why has God defeated us before? And I really think that's the right question. If our lives are facing repeated defeats and downturns and hassles and confrontations, I think this is a, a right question. Is there something in my life that prohibits God from coming to my rescue. Now, I'm not trying to say every negative thing that comes into our life is a result of sin, a result of my stupids, 
Most of mine are, but yours probably are. But I'm not trying to say it's, it's sin necessarily. I'm trying to say one of the best questions we can ask, God, is there something in me, in my life, that prohibits God from coming to my rescue? Or is he in the process of getting my attention so he could refine, <laughs> so he can purify my heart and my life? All my life, all my heart, all my soul, all my love. You know, I, I, I used to think that's how I loved God. And then I got married. And I remember Pastor Ross, the man we were working for at the time, he began to ask us to come to six o'clock prayer. I hated it. All I had to do was walk across the street. That's where my house was from the church. But to get up at six o'clock, oh, I was a late early. I was late at night and, and slept in late. I mean, that was my life. It was my rhythm. And I remember going because that was my job. And sometimes I engaged God and sometimes I engaged the carpet in a different kind of fashion. And I remember one morning, the Lord shared with me, showed me. He said, you know, if Donna were to roll over and say, let's go to breakfast, five o'clock in the morning. Let's go to Bob Evans for breakfast. You'd be up, you'd be out, and you'd be gone. She says, I'm not telling you to love her less. I'm just revealing to you that you can love me more. <laughs> oh. I remember a counseling story opportunity that I had here at Westgate and a person came in and was complaining about their family facing such difficulty and turmoil and, and stuff. And, and I don't, I'm sure it's just the Holy Spirit that gave me the question in my mind because finally, I, I, as she is describing the situation and wanting help, I finally looked at them and said, well, are you guys married? And, well, well no. I said, well, wait a minute, let me get this straight. You know what God says about living outside of marriage, and I reviewed that with her, and, and you're expecting God to bless you by living in this way? And it was like a freight truck hit her right here. It was like she never thought about it. She never saw that this part of her life would affect this part of her life. Yeah. And I have to give her credit because I've had these kinds of counseling situations before and people have walked out and said, well, you're just old fashioned. But she responded. I counseled that basically she needed to have him move out. They'd been with, with each other for five years and had children. And I said, he needs to move out until you can get this thing right. And she responded in that way. Second Chronicles 7.14 is very familiar with this. And it's one of my favorite scriptures in it. I'll quote it once again. It says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive, uh, heal, forgive their sins and heal their land. And I love to read that backwards. By that I mean, if my land, and that can be stipulated in so many different, my, my country, the country I, or my personal land called the Coleman, the land of Coleman. If, if my land is not healed, then maybe I need to, because God said, if my people, it's not talking about the world, it's talking about his people. If my people will humble themselves, simply meaning, I ain't got this right, God. Something's not working here. I don't know how to fix this. I can't make it better. If they will humble themselves and seek him, then he'll heal my land. So my question this morning is, what does your land look like? See, the right question is what they said, God, why did you defeat us before the Philistines? That's the right question. 
But if we read in verse 3, they come up with the wrong answer. Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubims. So what we know about the Shekinah glory mist of God is that it resided between the cherubims that sat on top of the ark who had their wings outstretched like this, one on that side, one on this side, and the Shekinah glory dwelled between the cherubim. And the elders of Israel, after the battle with the Philistines, decided that the next battle could be won if they took the Ark of the Covenant with their soldiers. You know, we know the Ark of the Covenant, it represents the presence of God, the throne of God. The elders wanted to take this representation of the throne of God out of the Holy of Holies. Now, it could be moved when the tabernacle was moved, but they wanted to cover it and bring it with them to battle that it might save us. And the elders rightly sensed they needed God's help to win the battle, but they were wrong in the way they sought it. Right question, wrong answer. And instead of humbling, repenting, seeking God, he's smacked us here. Why has this happened? Instead of them saying, God, what do we need to do in approaching you? They come up with a different answer that God never approved. They believe the presence of the ark would make God work for them. Now we say that's then and this is now, but you know what? We have a large segment of Christi Christianity that deals in the same kind of superstition. Name it, claim it, mark it, park it, and grab it and blab it. If I can name it and claim it, then God's got to give it to me. If I can act in this certain way, then God's, you know, it's almost like the last time God answered prayer, I was standing like this. And so the next time I go to him in prayer, I stand it's superstitious. We get very superstitious in our thinking. Their idea was that God should be forced to fight for them. And if he's not willing to do it for their sake, he would have to do it for his honor's sake, that it may save us from the hand of our enemies. They regarded the ark as the ultimate good luck charm. The ark was their rabbit's foot, and they believed they could not lose with it there. Instead of attempting to get right with God, these Israelites set their devising superstitious means other than introspection and repentance in securing the victory over their foes. Verse 5 says, and when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came out of the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. That's my kind of church service. Some people passing by Israel's camp would think, man, something tremendous was happening. All the noise and all the excitement meant nothing because it wasn't grounded in God's truth. They thought and, and acted just like the pagans. God is a person. He's not a genie that we can summon. It's not how we go to him in prayer. If we rub him just right, then I'll get an answer. Not only did Israel lose, they lost worse than they did before taking the ark into the battle. With the ark, more than seven times as many men in Israel were killed. Do you think God was trying to get somebody's attention? It's worse than just losing the battle. The very thing they thought would win the battle was captured. In my mind, I wonder, because I don't see this anywhere in Scripture, why didn't they immediately start scheming a rescue? If this item was so important, so very powerful, why didn't they pick seven ninjas and sneak into the Philistine camp and retrieve it? Israel thought that they could ignore the God of the ark and find deliverance in the ark of God. 1 Samuel 5 reads, first verse, And then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to Ashdod. 
So I'm, I'm just going to kind of, I don't want to read all of these scriptures, but it's important to the story, so I'm just going to kind of bullet point them real quick. So the ark that was captured is now in a city called Ashdod. They bring it into the temple of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And early in the morning, there was Dagon falling on his face before the ark of the Lord. And so they think, well, you know, may, maybe we left it unsettled. Maybe we, somebody bumped it. So the next, so they set it back in place. And the next morning, there was Dagon falling on his face before the ark of the Lord. Isn't that appropriate? And his head was broken and both palms and hands were broken off of the torso and only his torso was left. So they faced the God of Israel in battle and believed their God Dagon had delivered them and defeated Israel. So this was really something very difficult to understand. But the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod. And he ravaged them, Scripture says, and struck them with tumors. The ark of the Lord of Israel, the God of Israel, must not remain with us, they said. Let the ark of God be carried to Gath. <laughs> we don't want it to stay here in Ashdod. Let's send it to Gath. So, so what are these tumors? Older commentaries describe them as hemorrhoids. And newer commentaries, <coughs> commentators often describe them as a sign of bubonic plague. I mean, it's characterized by epidemic occurrence, by the appearance of tumors, by a high mortality rate in association with mice or rats. And the hand of the Lord was heavy against the city with a very great destruction. So the city of Gath, like Ashdod, didn't do any better. More of the destruction and painful tumors broke out on them. Verse 10 through 12 kind of talks about it. Sent the ark to God, then they sent it on to Ekron. Let's get it out of here. And, and Ekron said, they brought the ark of God in Israel to kill us. Send it away. Let it go back to its own place. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who did not die was, were stricken with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. What we're talking about here, I guess I could have titled this message, a tale of two battles, because we got a second battle coming. This is the first battle we're talking about. And the Ark of the Covenant was among the Philistines like a hot potato. <laughs> I don't want it, you take it. I don't want it, you take it. Devastating every city. First Samuel 6 talks about it was in, with the Philistines for seven months. There was more destruction in the times that the ark of God was in the Philistines' hands than the Israelites could have ever brought upon the nation. And they go to the priests, and they go to their diviners, and they say, what shall we do with this ark of the Lord? And the priests say, well, if you send away the ark of God of Israel, do not send it away empty. But by all means, return it to him with a trespass offering. And then they said, well, what is a trespass offering which, which we shall return to him? And they answered, give us five golden tumors and five golden rats according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. And here, I love this line, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. <laughs> Isn't that powerful? And you, the, the enemy, shall give glory and the priest continued to say, so why do you harden your hearts like the Egyptians and Pharaoh? I mean, they confessed that he was almighty God, yet they did not worship him instead of their gods. They set their God back up with a broken head and broken hands. Aware of the Exodus account, they knew what happened in Israel's history. The Philistines rightly remembered that, that no good comes from anyone who hardens their heart against the Lord. So they take the ark of the Lord and they set it on a cart and they put the ark articles of gold in a chest and they return it as a trespass offering and they send it away. Then it goes up the road to its own territory to Beth Shemesh and then he has done us this great evil. 
If it goes, let me say that again. If it goes up the road back toward Beth Shemeth, which is the city just inside Israel's territory, then we know that God has done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It has happened to us by chance. So the Philistines conduct an experiment. They threw out all the calamity of the plagues. They thought that all the calamity of the plagues was from God of Israel, but they were not 100% sure. So they devised this experiment. They take some cows who had just birthed some young cows, put the youngsters in the barn, hook these cows up to a yoke that they've never been yoked and never pulled a wagon before and let go. They're saying if it doesn't go back to Israel, then it was by chance. Because look how many hurdles has to happen before this ark actually goes back to God. In Samuel 6, 13, it says, Then the cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemeth and stood there. <laughs> I think it's interesting. They, just, they get there, and then they just stand. They're there. They didn't treat the ark as holy. Beth Shemesh didn't treat it as holy. Their curiosity got the best part of them. This is what stayed behind the, the uh, curtain in the tent of meeting. This was in the Holy of Holies. Nobody looked upon it, and nobody looked inside, and they made that mistake. And they've got differing um, arguments about how many died. Some said 50,000 died as a result of it. And so they sent a messenger to the inhabitants of Kerjath Kerim, saying, the Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come and take it up with you. Come get it, because we've not dealt with it correctly. So then the men of kirath Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadad on the hill. Pastor Alec talked about this some time ago and consecrated Eleazar, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. So it was the ark that the ark remained in Kerjath Jerim a long time. It was there 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Now, wait a minute. The ark is back. Maybe they've learned a lesson. Maybe they realized that the ark just represented God's favor. But God himself was what needed to be sought. Israel had the ark back, but there was things weren't really set right. Instead of, instead, all the house of Israel lamented. Vanessa, that's your word. They mourned for the presence after the Lord, and they had good reason to lament. They understood the condition of their land was directly related to the relationship to God. I want you to hear that. They understood that their land was directly related to their relationship to God. How about your land? How about the land of our nation? How about the land of our church? It's directly related to our relationship to God. Their cities were still in ruin. Their armies were defeated. And they were under Philistine domination. Nothing's changed all because they were not right with God. Verses 3, then Samuel spoke, I believe he's answering the lament, to all the house of Israel saying, if you return, it's another word for repent, to the Lord with all your heart, with all your hearts, then put away their foreign gods and the asterisks from among you, and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only. And then prepare your heart for the Lord. A part of that preparation for me is, oh God, is there something in me that prohibits you from acting strong in my behalf? Is there something in me that would inhibit you from blessing me and serve him only? And he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. 
he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistine. So Samuel calls the nation to repentance. Israel did not feel that they had rejected God. They still believed in the God of Israel. They still served him and sacrificed and went to the temple. But what they, they only added the worship of the other gods to their worship. Do you understand that the opposite of the word pure is mixture? Pure is just, it's nothing else but Sugar, <laughs> pure sugar. That's all there is in that bowl is sugar. But mixture means other things are added to it, so it's not only, purely only. And God is saying, serve me and serve me only. I won't take a mixture of your worship. And they added the worship of other gods. So Samuel called in Israel to turn their backs on these other add-on gods and put away Baals and Ashtoreths and serve the Lord only and he will deliver you from the hand. How did Israel not feel they had rejected the Lord? I don't understand. And so the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. Verse 5, and Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mizpah. And I will pray to the Lord for you. Now, one of the things you need to know is in the first battle, when they wiped out the, the 4,000, maybe the 30,000, that they came back and destroyed Shiloh. Shiloh was the place where the ark resided. Shiloh was where the temple of God was, the tent that Moses created. That's where the ark resided. They, Shiloh's wiped out. And so Samuel calls him to Mizpah. And I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and said, there, we've sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. He knew God's work in them could only be completed through prayer. And prayer is simply calling out to God to have him do what I can't do. Isn't that what prayer is? I mean, I worship him, yes. But in my request, it's because if I can do it, I'll do it. So prayer is asking God to come do what I can't do. And this showed the spiritual need Israel felt at that time because they all gathered at Mizpah. They expressed their repentance both by putting away the bad and by pursuing the good. The experience of conviction of sin proves nothing. It's our response to conviction that demonstrates repentance. So they drew water out and poured it before the Lord. I think the context is a ceremonial pouring of water. It demonstrates the soul poured out. It's an expression of emptiness, of need, and they express the same hearts as Lamentations 2.19 that reads, Arise, cry out in the night at the beginning of the watches. Pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. I don't know about you, but during this time of seclusion, that's really been on my heart. It's really been a... And it's almost like I don't have words to articulate, but there's a groan that comes up out of my innermost belly, and I just want to just groan before God. I just want to pour out, oh, God, we need you. Our land is sick. We need you. So they fasted that day and said, there, we've sinned against the Lord. So they expressed their sorrow by fasting. It's a message that nothing else matters except getting right with God. And I don't know if you understand, but Israel, when they fasted, it wasn't just no more popcorn. But they would put on sackcloth. Now, what does that mean? It means it wasn't smooth like silky cotton. It, it was rough against the skin. It made you uncomfortable. 
And then they poured ashes on top of their head, which again is rough and grainy and uncomfortable. They were saying, we're not going to seek the pleasure, our pleasure for today. Instead, we're going to seek God. So here they are in this fasting situation, having not eaten, and confession is a straightforward claim of guilt and responsibility. If it is meant from the heart, it's hard to make a better statement of confession than we've sinned against you. I've blown this God. I really didn't choose correctly. I really didn't act in accordance to what you've called me to do. Verse 7 says, Now when the Philistines heard, you understand, they're still the roaring crowd that feels like they control Israel. When they heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel, and when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. Battle number two. The, the Philistines saw all of Israel gather. Well, we got them all in one place. Now's the chance. We overwhelmed them in number, so, and we under, uh, uh, overwhelmed them with our arms. And, and look, they're, they're fasting. I mean, they're weak. They're sitting in ash, ashes and, and sackcloth. They're, they're you know, wow, what a, what a better time. Let's go get them. They may have said, look at these weak Israelites. <laughs> they're such wimps, fasting, crying out before their God like this. I mean, we'd never cry before our God's like that. Verse 8 says, so the children of Israel said to Samuel, they were afraid. Remember, that was the last verse I read. They didn't then say, okay, get the ark. They didn't say, well, we better go saddle up the horses. They didn't have a strategy about their strategy was, Samuel, don't cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us. The enemy's coming. Samuel, don't stop. Don't, don't change your tactic. Cry out to the Lord your God for us that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it. Worship didn't change. The enemy has surrounded. They're encroaching and coming against our land. They're moving against us to destroy us. And Samuel continues to worship and to sacrifice, offered as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord of Israel, and the Lord answered him. <laughs> the last time Israel was in this kind of situation, they said, go get the ark. We can't lose. Look at the lesson that they've learned. Now they were much wiser before the Lord. And instead of trusting in the ark, they did the right thing. They asked Samuel to cry out to the Lord and not to stop. And Samuel offers this sacrifice. He took time for the sacrifice at a critical time because he knew that God was their only hope. And he took a suckling lamb, an innocent lamb, its blood poured out, its body cut up, its carcass burned. Why? Because Samuel and Israel had to say, this is what we deserve. <laughs> this is the punishment that should come upon us because we've not treated you as holy. Because we've not lived our life purely before you. We've not sought you and you alone. We thank you, God, for accepting the punishment of this innocent lamb instead of requiring it of us. And when we trust in our Lord, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, we're saying the same thing. That which was done to him upon the tree, I deserve. I deserve because I've lived life my way and I've been selfish and I've been arrogant and I've been judgmental. And, and the Lord answered him. <laughs> See, the battle wasn't, hadn't yet fought. And, and the hostile Philistine army approached. Yet in a real way, the battle was over. <laughs> Already won because the Lord answered him. 
verse 10. Now, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, and the Lord thundered <laughs> with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. Used to live in Oklahoma. Man, can some storms blow through. Thunder sets you straight up out of your bed in the middle of the night. But I want you to ca cap capture this picture. It's God just didn't go boom. <laughs> God went boom, 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 boom. And they were so rattled and confused that they were overcome by Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as Beth Car. And then Samuel stood, took up a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shin. And he called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far, <laughs> the Lord has helped us. Can you say that in your testimony? Looking back over my life, we used to attend a church in Oklahoma City where a portion of the church, a large portion of the church was African-American, Nigerian, came from many different. And there was one large African lady in spiked heels who would get up and sing a song going, I've looked back over my life and I think things over and I can truly say that I've been blessed. I got a testimony. And the rest of the song was her dancing across the stage going, I got a testimony. I got a testimony. Have you got a testimony this morning? Thus far, God has showed up for me. He has helped me. God fought the heavens, brought heavens on behalf of Israel, and defeated the Philistines. It was a special work of God because the Israelites heard the same thunder. But only the Philistines became so confused that they were overcome. He not only sent thunder to confuse the Philistines, but to bring confidence in Israel. If we ever have a day when we need confidence in God, it's now. The enemy surrounds. We hear the turmoil. We can see the future. Yes, we know the end of the world is close. It's got to start sometime. But God doesn't mean he's not for me. It doesn't mean he won't show his arms strong. So he sent the thunder to bring confidence to the Israelites. This is the kind of victory they hoped for in Samuel 4 when they brought the Ark of the Covenant into battle. If they'd only repented and sought the Lord as they did here, they could have had this kind of victory long ago. The Lord won this battle, not Israel. So Samuel named this stone Ebenezer, meaning stone of help. Thus far the Lord has helped us. Verse 13, so the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come any more into the territory of Israel. Now, I, I kind of had to look at that. Is that right? Because we see other battles with the Philistines, but they never win back cities. They raid. They just become the raiders, but they no longer have land. <laughs> they no longer have territory. They no longer can invade in my land. The hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Cities were restored that belonged to Israel. Now get this, and also there was peace between Israel and the Ammonites. So on the west side, the Philistines won't come. And on the east side, the Amorites, God has worked peace. Look at the difference between these two cities. The first battle, they would do anything but call upon the Lord. A time of confession, I guess. Because prayer is difficult. And I'm convinced if we can do anything else but pray, we will. Is anybody with me? I come to prayer and everything else becomes important. Well, if I, if I read the news, then I know what to pray for. You know, if uh, even even... If I read the word, now, if you pray the word back to him, that's a different thing. 
But is, is anybody like me? Is it like I, I can do anything but pray? I will do anything but call upon the Lord, anything but fast and pray, anything but repentance because that demands relationship. The second battle, they recognized their only hope was calling upon the Lord. Church, I'm, I'm calling you to understand it's our only hope. And I want to tell you, Fight the resistance to not pray. Well, I don't, I can't, in, well, it doesn't matter if you can engage or not. Begin to pray. Just begin to pray. What I find is I feel like, I, man, there's no prayer in me. I don't have any prayer in me. I don't want to pray. I'm tired of praying. And then I start praying and it explodes. Because it's just waiting. My spirit is just waiting. Call upon the Lord with repentance and fasting, seeking his deliverance. As I said, there are various kinds of lands we can analyze this morning, the lands of our own hearts and lives. If our land is destroyed, if our borders are torn down, then maybe the right question is, God, what, have, what do I have in my life that prohibits you from showing yourself strong? In America, we see, obviously, that our land is not healed, and the word promises that if my people, then I will heal their land. I believe the land of the church at large looks devastated to me. What is the normal life of the church supposed to look like? And have I settled for what I've seen? What is a church walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit supposed to look like? I don't mean we shout and dance across the stage, and I'm all for that. I mean that we see deaf ears hear, blind eyes see, the dead live again. Isn't that what Jesus said? He came to announce the kingdom of God. I'm not trying to be harsh or judgmental. But there are things in the land of the church that is prohibiting. Uh, my qu it's a question. Are there things in the land of the church that are prohibiting the Lord from moving? Are we heartbroken over injustice? Is there arrogance and pride? Selfishness in our lives of the believer. I'm not trying to indict anyone. I'm just asking some questions, and I'm hoping the right questions. We're called to be a powerful, changing agent in our world. Are we? If not, then why? I believe we need to continue to cry out. Westgate's been a place to cry out. The Lord's heard our cry. I'm not trying to diminish what has been happening the last 25, 30 years. I'm not trying to say we've answered that call. But we have to continue to cry out, to pour out like water, to lament because the conditions of our land and seek him for the answers. Maybe even repent. Father, we come before you this morning. Not trying to bring a negative word to bring us down, but attempting God to see how I can love you more. What do you require of me, God? How have I lived my life? Are there things in me that prohibit you from moving strongly in my land, in the land of the Colemans, in the land of Westgate, in the land of America. Oh, God, we cry out, we need you. God, we repent. Holy Spirit, reveal to us as individuals the things that get in our heart. God, I, I can become, and nobody would know it because I never speak it, but God, I can become so judgmental so quickly. Critical. 
God, forgive me for a critical spirit. Forgive me, Lord. Hear our cry. Hear our call. God, we ask that you move by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.